Hey, it's Doran Dutch with Tactical Hive. Today's video, we're going to be going over our picks for the most influential weapons that we think has made like kind of the biggest innovations, the biggest impact on the modern battlefield. Sitting around with nothing to do, we figured we'd just yeah. discuss this with you. But it's just in our opinion, or my opinion, or whatever, uh, some of the most influential weapons, uh, mostly rifles, of the, uh, the modern warfare. Not sorry, we're going from old times to new times. Hey, before we get to the video, I just wanted to touch on a quick tip, and that's regards to dry fire training. Dry fire training is very important. When I taught pistol marksmanship, we were running primarily a 226 9mm, and it is a double to single trigger pull, double to single action. So when you're training dry fire, you have that double action. If you want to cock it back, you can. It's very easy. But in more re modern times, we switched to a Glock striker fire platform, which if you want to dry fire, you have to rack the slide every single time. And that is incredibly annoying and inefficient. So we went ahead and went online, did some research, and we found Dry Fire Mag. Now Dry Fire Mag is sponsoring this video. And I just wanted to let you guys know that when we bought these, we instantly implemented them into the training regimen and got right back to where we were with the 226. How these things work is you seat them right into the pistol, rack, let it set, you pull the trigger, it's a little bit stiff on the first one, and then it goes right into normal trigger pull. The magazine resets the trigger, same as a live fire shot, and it just makes training that much faster and efficient. Check out the link below and use coupon code TACHIVE for $10 off a purchase. Now let's get to the video. All right, we're back, guys, and uh, we're going to be covering some of the most, what we believe to be the most influential weapons that really move the change and reset the bar for a battlefield performance in regards to small arms. No, I think you're right. It's influential. Yeah. And hey, listen, are we going to name all the rifles and all the pistols ever created by man? No. 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 Certainly not. Oh, by the way, before we even start, because we are going to include weapons like the Glock. So we're going to include this. So we want you to know that we know that Gaston Glock was not the first guy to create a polymer-framed striker-fired pistol. But we do know who it was, and we'll tell you at the end of the video. So stay tuned for all you smart guys. Uh, we have that, we, we'll nerd out on that just a little bit. So up first, we've got the uh, Brown Bess. First up. English flintlock rifle used uh, in the beginning of the advancing of the English Empire and in the Revolutionary War was the 72 caliber, and they made a smaller caliber as well, mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure. Yeah, 72 caliber brown Bess. She was big, bro. Mm. I think it was, uh, the longest ones were 66 inches or so. 72 caliber ball. Can you imagine, right? This is bigger mm -hmm. than a paintball. Yeah, you slightly bigger this, right? than a paintball. Bigger than a paintball. <laughs> You imagine lugging around a bunch of 72 caliber lead balls uh, and powder yeah. and working a 60 inch rifle. How many guys complain about a 10 inch rifle? Oh, it's too big, it's too small. <laughs> My goodness, man, 60 inch, 72 caliber beast. Uh, but a well-aimed marksman, mm -hmm. uh, give or take a well-trained marksman can shoot three to four rounds in a minute. I, I give you, I bet you three, mm -hmm. I bet you three. Yeah, black powder, muzzle loading, flintlock rifle. So that's number one on the list. It really made the, the list just because of its track record and the what it accomplished, what the British Empire was able to accomplish while using it. It was mass produced. It was reliable. You could part, change parts out from one to the other, which was at that time extremely rare. A great bayonet system with the bayonet yep. lugs. And I mean, the thing just worked. And, and we're, we're going in chronological order here too. So this is, we're talking, this is the, the late, mid to late 1700s. So that's where we're starting first. We're, we're gonna start mm -hmm. there first, the beginning of the British Empire, and we're gonna go rolling into the Re Re uh, Revolutionary War. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're doing things chronologically. Hopefully. <laughs> so 
So number two, we have the repeaters. Yeah, number two on this, we're, we're gonna, going to gloss over some time. So don't be all upset about, you know, if you're missing your most famous rifle that you love, like the Pennsylvania rifle or some frontier rifle that you loved. So we're going to gloss over some of that. We're going to go to Civil War. Mm -hmm. So Civil War game changers. Look, think about the technology here. Instead of a flintlock, now we're using cap and ball. Mm -hmm. Still though, a well-trained marksman is only going to shoot three to four rounds a minute. That's mm -hmm. it. You're still doing a lot of the same mechanics. Yeah, things had not progressed very far. Until, dun, 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 right? Spencer, Henry, there were some other ones as well, but Spencer and Henry, uh, Christopher Spencer and, I honestly can't tell you all the history about uh, Henry, they started making repeating rifles. So first seen in 1863, give or take, mm -hmm. in uh, Gettysburg. A lot of folks like to think that Buford's men stopped Ewell's guys, Ewell's Corps at the Seminary Ridge with the repeaters. Not necessarily true. The repeater was used there, but not until really day three in Gettysburg was the repeater made a big difference. Now we talked about the, uh, the technology here. So real quick, a well-trained marksman can shoot three to four rounds a minute with a ball, a black, black powder ball rifle or mm -hmm. cabin ball, right? And now, now that we're, with the repeater, we're talking 14 to 20 rounds a minute. Mm -hmm. Huge difference here, right? What kind of horsepower now do you have um, in, in battle. So it was definitely a force multiplier. Yeah, huge difference right there. So and what was also unique about Henry and Spencer, by the way, those companies would only do business with Union armies and would not do business with the Confederate armies. So therefore the Union army, well, we already know that it had most of the industrialized portions of the United States at that time were in the North. And here in this case, only Henry and only Spencer, only dealing with the Union armies and not the Confederates. Next up at number three, we've got the Springfield 1903 30-06. This thing was a workhorse for many decades and spanned multiple wars, uh, but it did start off its career as basically a blatant copy of the, uh, the Mauser, the German Mauser rifle. Our guys went up against the Mauser in Cuba at the very end of the 1800s with the Krag Jorgensen, and our gun was already obsolete. That trap door was not, could not compete with the five round uh, clips so it's a five round clip, yeah. bolt fed, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So the magazine, give or take, as a, a clip goes inside of the middle of the gun, right? Yeah, just that stripper clip. Yep. Um, you know, Americans fed their rifles with clips for many, many years, really until the M14, which is why people keep calling mags clips. But, you know, it's another story. You think for another those day. people know? Those people don't know either. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, I heard some politician call it a clip and then there it's clip now forever. Yeah, it's just people won't change. People are afraid of change. People hate change. <laughs> but anyhow, um, this weapon was a copy of the German Mauser, and after World War I, I believe Mauser successfully sued the United States government, and restitution that? was paid. How about that? Yeah, but uh, it really was a, it got us up to the modern in the big leagues, because the Russians had their Mosin Nagant, Germans had their Mauser, and then, you know, we answered with the 1903 Springfield, and it stayed relevant. I mean, we, it was the weapon that predominantly started us out in World War II. The M1s, you know, were being backfilled, but the Marines, went into Guadalcanal with 1903 Springfields. Well, the, the, the Springfield 30-06 bolt action rifle was also used as a sniper weapon in World War II. Mm -hmm. So it's, it certainly wasn't obsolete. Uh, but with the next on the list rifle, the incoming M1 Garand, mm. right? So arguably the Number rifle four. that saves the world. You can go into different tools that save the world when it comes to what happened at D-Day, like the Higgins boats, uh, but without the M1 Garand, without this semi-automatic, eight-shot, clip-fed workhorse of a gun, you're talking about a workhorse of a gun, it's a fantastic gun. If you've never shot one before, you need to, you need to try it. Uh, but a you know, big round, heavy gun, reliable, without a doubt. In my opinion, it's, yeah. a, it's the tool that probably saved the world. So. Yeah, it was a quantum leap in firepower, and at the end of the day, you know, after World War II, they did a lot of number crunching and a lot of analysis. And, you know, man for man, the, the guy that was sending more accurate fire is going to win. Oh, yeah. And uh, that I'm not going to argue with that. It definitely works. And that M1 Grand with being able to reload it faster, larger, I guess we'll call it clip capacity. And it was just, you could just beat down your enemy faster. Regular infantryman of the United States Army runs a Grand. Regular infantryman of the German Army runs a five shot. Mm -hmm. Car 98, K98 Mauser, which is just a smaller version of the, the aforementioned mm -hmm. Mauser. Fantastic rifle, don't get me wrong. You can put it on the list too. But 
guess what? It's five compared to eight. Uh, your your the speed of which you could load that Garand, mm -hmm. right? Clips right on your uh, your LBE, right? Mm -hmm. here, psh, clip right back in the gun. Not so on the the Car 98. You got to put those rounds inside that magazine to get that bullfed action going. So, you know, well, K98 had the five round stripper clip. I knew that. Yeah, I knew that. K98, yeah. So, and that's why we copied it. Pushing it. We used the same the same thing for the uh, 1903, but that's okay. We'll just cut all that out. No, or not. Um, or Could be good. Or not. Or keep it in. Whatever works. I can make a mistake. Yeah. Damn, um, it. Damn it. Cut right. that out. So we're at World War II, um, but. Innovation was not done. You know, we had American innovation by way of Canadian. I think John Garand was a Canadian, but I don't uh, know. yeah, I think he was. But it's okay. We're all, they're all Americans up there, you know, deep down. We're all together. And there's all, uh, North America, you know, we're all North America. America yeah. Yeah. Well, back then it was part of the Five Eyes, still part of the Five Eyes. If you yeah. don't know what that is, that's America, it's Canada, that's England, that's Australia, and New Zealand. So there's mm -hmm. your five greatest. Uh, English-speaking nations of the planet. That's the five eyes. So a lot of good guns in World, uh, World War II that we're not even covering, right? We're not, not talking about the 30 caliber machine gun. We're not talking about the Thompson 45 caliber uh, mm -hmm. machine gun. We're not talking about the 30 caliber carbine. Uh, we're not talking about the MG42, the MG34, which are great machine guns that the Germans made. Mm -hmm. We're not talking about that. Not just yet. Not just yet. Maybe, in, maybe another episode. But what's next on the list, I believe, is German-made, mm -hmm. the granddaddy of all time. If you guys out there like the AK-47, this is what Mr. Kalishnikov copied, right? This is the Sturmgewehr mm -hmm. STG-44. Definitely a quantum leap. I mean, it gave you really the firepower needed of a submachine gun, but it, the range, what, like more than quadrupled? Yeah, I mean, what, what's, what, uh, what was the chamber? 792 by 33. Yeah. 792 by 33. They call it an 8 millimeter. Um, they, they call it the 8 millimeter short. Kurtz, yeah. yeah 8 millimeter short. Uh, fantastic. Well, turbo ballistics, good round, high capacity, a 30 round magazine. Mm -hmm. uh, this was the Sturm Gewehr. Okay, so you guys who don't know German, you do know German, whatever. Assault rifle, mm -hmm. assault weapon, really, what it would Gewehr. But so, okay, so now, now we're at the very first assault rifle. And again, it's what, what Mr. Kalishnikov, uh, he stole that idea. And that's really what they almost look. If you look at those pictures side by side, a lot they kind of look like an AK. Yeah, you know, not there, but kind of. So we just circle it back around to the M1 Grand. The next gen was what became the M14, which is yep. a box magazine, detachable box magazine, 20 round M14 or M1 Grand. M1 Grand, yeah. So same rolling block system, mm -hmm. uh, same guts basically, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned earlier when we were talking about, so you know a little bit more about why we went from 30-06, mm -hmm. heavy round, large cartridge, to the 762 by 51 Yeah, there were developments in powder. The powder became more efficient. They were able to, you know, during the war, obviously, defense spending, you know, it, capitalism, it uh, incentivizes people to create better. Shocker. Shocker, yeah. So they came up with better powder, and they were able to push that 30 caliber round at a faster velocity. Out of, with with a smaller cartridge, a you know, smaller amount of powder, so it just lightened the load of the soldier, and um, it was kind of a seamless transition. If you nice. if you could shoot an M1 Grand with a day of training, you were a, a pro with an M14. Like it really was. Yeah, you know, there's a lot of politics and there's a lot of uh, hate for the M14 because the Fin Fowl was supposed to be the NATO rifle, and there was actually a comparable to 6.5 round that they were, it was called uh 270 british or something like that okay and they were all good all of nato was going to go to that and you know army ordinance and dc had their own ideas of what we needed so we stuck with 30 caliber and we stuck with the uh gen 2 m1 grand if you think about the quick segue to 30 caliber mm -hmm. if you think of all the weapons that are basically 30 caliber a, a shit ton of them mm -hmm. i mean really almost all the weapons out there that people are regularly using on a on a daily basis so a whole lot of them are 30 caliber mm -hmm. a whole lot of them uh so again we're glossing over a couple of weapons too the you know honorable mention uh lee enfield um the the bren uh there's some really cool weapons that the british made for sure uh that had something to do with winning the war of course but you know i'm sticking on my i'm sticking to my guns about the grand hey before we continue on to probably the most popular sporting rifle of all time, let's talk pistols. So obviously 
This one's got the best, I think the 1911's got to have the longest combat track record. I mean, it's still technically being used to this day in the Marine Corps, um, well over 100 years. I mean, I love the thing. Why is it called 1911? Because that was the year it was adopted. Bingo! I already knew that, Boom. by the way. But Boom. Yeah. How, how, how iconic of a design is this that it still lasts and, oh, by the way, it's, it's baby brother, uh, which are some of the most popular pistols out there now, is the 2011. So this one in particular is a staccato, but the, there are a lot of great little guns still using the same technology, right? It's almost exactly the same technology. There's a couple of things in here that are different, but for the most part, right, there's the same gun. Mm -hmm. Love it. So uh, striker fire guns. Yeah, the one, the only, the Glock, you know, we know it, we love it. Do we, it, uh, do we love it? Yeah, it's, it's, it's reliable. I mean, the AK-47 is the best-selling, most successful combat arm of all time, arguably gun of all time. Well, the Glock is the most successful pistol of all time, and that's for the exact same reason. It's reliability. Cheap, easy to manufacture, and it just works. It's a Jeep. Yeah, right? it's a Jeep. You press the trigger, it's gonna go bang for the most part. It's gotta be, is, is this is not the most photographed weapon of all time? I mean, every it's, movie's, right? Yeah. How, how often do you see these uh, you know, law enforcement officers in a movie uses them? Somebody always you know, has a Glock in their hand, so yeah. Yeah, so Gaston Glock, 1981. Uh, what was Gaston doing before he came up with uh, the Glock 17? He was in the defense manufacturing business. So, and then also other stuff. And he made curtain rods. Yeah. You know, he made mess kits. He made bayonets. He made entrenching tools. He made, and that's when you, you see, like, Glock still sells entrenching tools and knives. And Glock, you, yeah, one of the things he like did, a you know, legacy he item. was doing polymer stuff for sheets, for knives. Yeah. And is that how he started doing the, the polymer yeah, idea? Yeah, I mean... He, uh, he definitely had his roots in manufacturing. Legend has it he dug a pit outside of his garage and he would just tinker around with his design. He'd go down a ladder into the pit and just shoot into the dirt. Then he'd go back up and keep messing around with it. It took him 17 tries, but huh. the Glock 17 was his first patent that I believe he got in the very early So 80s. then he was the first guy to make a striker fired gun? No, nah, <gasps> necessarily. No. no, he just, uh, he was able to make it cheap and uh, reliable and it took a long time for glocks to really take off i mean 1981 yeah you know that was a long time ago but by 1991 everybody knew what a glock was Damn right. and uh, by 2001 they were they had to have been the best seller by then yeah now I mean, we have top tier guys mm -hmm. uh top tier armed forces across the globe yeah. but more importantly america using the glocks for a secondary gun right yeah Tempers. it's the uh it is the weapon of special operations so what is or who did or both who developed the first striker fire gun? Well, according to Professor Google. According to our sources. Yeah, according to our massive amount of diligent research that we did. Let me just double check real quick here. <laughs> HK. Yeah, HK. 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 The, the Germans, which yeah. were right across the uh, the way from Austria. I mean, is it is it right to call it ugly? It's definitely a voluptuous curves, <laughs> the VP9. It's ugly. Yeah. It's ugly. It's got a 20 pound trigger pull, according to our sources. And uh, I've never fired one before. Yeah. Uh, but then there was the P7 as well, right? The P7 mm -hmm. comes out after that, another HK gun. So, you Glock guys, you Glock fans out there, Gaston Glock, not the first guy to create a striker fired weapon. No. How about that? Now you know. But Henry Ford didn't create the assembly line either. But damn it, he, uh, he took it all the way to the finish line. <laughs> he made it right, though. Yeah. Apparently. Apparently, he made it right. In chronological format, we head on towards the Vietnam era. Mm -hmm. And that brings out the M14, now going away. AR-15, now coming into, into light. Also, the AK-47. You want to cover something uh, on the uh, AR platform? Uh, AR platform was officially came out in the late 50s, but you know it was a brand new revolutionary design. Aluminum parts, plastic parts, small, fast varmint cartridge. And the Army, you know, Army Ordnance, again, still living in a 30 caliber world. You know, we just came off of World War One, World War II, Korea, everything was going great. Um, but there was definitely a, a lacking, we had a deficit, and that was that intermediate range firepower. In urban combat, that 30-06, which later became, you know, our 308 Winchester, 
it was just, it was big, it was heavy, it was hard to wield. And frankly, you know, the, the M1 carbine and the 45 caliber submachine guns, they, they were just, it just wasn't enough. Yeah. They, were, they were too short. They really missed an opportunity with that M1 carbine going with such an anemic cartridge, but we'll get into that in another video. They needed that intermediate, you know, 100 to 400 yard sweet spot. And the Germans nailed it on the head with the SCG-44. It was too late in the war to make any big significant uh, changes, but the Russians took note and uh, they, they hit it hard with the AK-47. Um, the AK-47 went through continuous uh, development, you know, really AK-47s are AKMs, but America's answer was the AR-15 and that 5.56. So more portability. Yeah, lighter weight. More ammunition capability. Much more. Right, so now the infantry gets about 210 rounds of ammunition. Mm -hmm. I don't know what he had with M14. But now we got about 210 rounds of ammunition. Uh, plastic, portable, but you said high speed varmint type caliber. Right mm -hmm. now we're at a 5.56223. 5, so uh, was it really optimal in the jungle? Yeah, it didn't. definitely didn't have the weight behind it to punch through foliage, but uh, you can't argue with that 20 inch burn. You know, if you're sending that 55 grain uh, round at 3,100 feet per second, you know, which I've barely ever done in my life, you know, I've always had the carbines and the, even the shorter ones, but uh, you know, the thing is moving. Oh yeah, it'll And uh, the, the troops weren't complaining about the performance of the ammo. They were complaining about the, the performance of the weapon up front in the early days of the war, but it was actually the ammo that was causing the problems. Oh yeah. You know, crazy world. But once they got that all figured out, we never looked back. I mean, the, M the M4 and the M16s are all phased out by yeah, now, but we still have right. M4. Well, M16A2, that was still in use mm -hmm. really in the days of the war. That mm -hmm. was certainly still in use. Uh, you know, they married a good round to it, a pretty good round, 62 grain uh, uh, steel core follower, uh, mm -hmm. the A55, the green tip. Yeah, so uh, we had the, the A1s with the one and 12 twist barrels during the Vietnam era, but then in the 80s, yep. we got bored because there was nothing going on. So they developed the whole A2 um, one and seven twist series. And that was for that green tip yep. round that had the penetrator. That round was made for that gun. Yeah, and that's, it was, and that's that arms race between body armor and the round that's gonna defeat it. And that is something that is still going on to this day. Um, but yeah, it just, it keeps innovating. The, uh, the what became the 900 series, they're the flat tops, which were the M4s. I mean, the development for that stuff started in the, the late eighties, really with uh, your alma mater. We're, I think, at the forefront of that development with Colt, right alongside Colt. Um, but yeah, you can't argue with the AR-15. It, it, it has come full circle because my last two deployments, the bad guys were predominantly, or bad guys, however you want to look at we're shooting M-16s and M-4s. You know, saw quite a bit of uh, 5.56 five, coming back the other way. <laughs> like, whoa, whoa. So um, we're kind of a victim of, it, the, the rifle's kind of a victim of its own success, the platform. Just like the AK, it's kind of been pushed out and throughout the world, and we're seeing them come back at us. To me, it's a fantastic platform. It's one of, yeah. it's one of my most favorite uh, platforms to fire, right? Ergonomically, mm -hmm. with the ambidextrous work, if you have you ever gone with ambidextrous safety on it and magazine releases, it's ergonomically well done. So, and if you ever take this thing apart too, right? If you know what Stoner did back in the day, and I want to talk to you about what AR is and what AR isn't, but. Uh, if you take this thing apart, if you go find on YouTube, take the gun apart, look at it, check out the cycles of uh, functioning, it's a fantastic machine, man. Mm -hmm. It's an unbelievable machine that is so popular today. It's still like you know, it's still the most popular sporting rifle uh, of all time. Yeah, and the the most modern, you know, mil spec gas tube uh, versions. You know, that have that M4 feed ramp and you know have that little bit looser tolerances. Man, if you just keep the lubing those things they run for a nah, very it's lightweight it very runs. long time uh, it's a good gun without a doubt it's a funny thing ar mm -hmm. armor light assault rifle mm -hmm. what is yeah. it yeah armor light rifle pattern 15 it's armor light yeah there's actually several rifle. there's quite a few different armor light rifles i have an ar7 that's cool i know you guys covered this once upon a time but i can't tell people enough that it doesn't mean assault rifle no right it doesn't mean assault rifle so just stop stop with that yeah. storm gewehr SDG 44, 1944. That's an assault rifle. Because it has a select fire capability. Because it's called an assault rifle. Yeah. Yeah. Now they're at that. So we covered a lot of ground today. 
We've covered a lot of ground with, with regards to rifles, uh, the influence in combat with these rifles, and some pistols as well. Uh, we certainly hope you have enjoyed it. If you did enjoy it, like it, subscribe it. Hit the bell to get that feed you need from Tactical Hive. Yeah. Uh, Hit us up in the comments. Let me let us know what you think. You know, if you think uh, there was something else that really, you know, had an indelible mark on them, you know, the development and the really the capability of what a single soldier on the battlefield could accomplish. You know, let us know. We'd love to hear that stuff. There's plenty of out there, so just yeah. keep feeding us too. Right on. All right, this is Dorn in Dutch. Dutch out. Tactical hive. See you next time.